Anna Busso, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Assistant Secretary, I, I too want to um, assist the tribes in having the ability to basically self-govern themselves and make these decisions. <clears throat> However, I don't want to open it up to further litigation by if we have a problem with the bill. One of the issues, <coughs> excuse me, that concerns me is really uh, the fact that, I think you mentioned it in page two of your testimony, the two of the bill would basically, um, any restricted fee land held by tribe would be Indian country upon the request of the secretary to transfer. Now, I understand that it doesn't do true alienation, and it also uh, has the, uh, then the ability to be protected from taxation. One of the, um, the testifiers who are going to follow you raised a concern of the Carcieri decision and so I, I want to know how you understand this provision to interact with lands that you are presently holding in trust that under Carcieri may have been, I think it's post 1934, so there's a question or cloud on those lands. I mean, if this is passed, that provision is enacted, do you see it as actually clearing up those lands that are presently held in trust by the secretary because this provision would automatically make them Indian country? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, with respect to Carcieri, I, I think there are some pending uncertainties of some of those lands that are, are in trust, but I, and a number of cases are in litigation as we speak. I, I do think that the, at least from our perspective, Department of Interior and our lawyers stand ready and prepared to defend the prior decisions under Quiet Title Act provisions and that we would um, try to uphold whatever decisions were made so that the Cartieri implications would not cloud the title on that. And, and prospectively, um, if there's other lands that come into trust that have, could have potentially Cartieri issues to go transition into this process, I'm, I'm not clear on exactly the interplay between those and likely the Cartieri fix would still be necessary in order to protect those acquisitions. So I guess my, my question, though, is given the language of this bill, and, you know, the chair will always tell you Congress can fix anything. So with the language of this bill, it seems that if the land is in trust, that's condition one, and the, the, the tribe asks that it be transferred into this category uh, of um, restricted fee tribal lands, that those restricted fee tribal lands then become by definition Indian country, and I assume would then then be benefiting from the full, whatever that ball of rights comes with being Indian country. So would you agree with that, that that's what will happen? I, I would agree. I would, I would only um, add a few remarks in that respect. When, this, when the bill here starts to, um, at the tribe's request, has it converted from trust status to restricted fee? And, and I know that um, listening to some of the tribal reps are going to talk about what it's like with restricted fee and some of the success stories, and I'm sure there are some where they weren't successful. Historically, what has happened is that regardless of the property ownership and the underlying land, tribes have been able to alienate it. It's always been restricted on how they could alienate it. For the longest period of time, for the first century, it was by treaty process and only by treaty process. And then at the end of the treaty making period, as we go in, then it's by uh, specific federal statute. And then eventually we get into general federal statutes, uh, including the Indian Mineral Leasing Act of 1955. And then you have the rights of way statute from 1948. And those just set a general standard and then uh, um, provide for federal approval. And I think uh, that the, the entire process, if you convert it to restricted fee, may not necessarily solve those problems. It's the actions of the use of the property uh, whenever it has its status. So is it subject to the, the rights of way approval or easements? Is it subject to um, the, the uh, Indian Mineral Leasing Act? Uh, are those going to be superseded in here? You do attach it to 415, which is the Indian Mineral Leasing Act, and you say that it wouldn't follow what the statutes say, and that also presumably would be different than the Hearth Act, which has the 25-year and 25-year renewal. So, there, I mean, there are several options Secretary, on the table. Secretary, I'm running out of time, so I just want to put in this other question and ask you to finish that thought in writing. Subsection D, though, gives this, this under this law, 
preemptive power. So you're raising all these other statutes, but my question is, one, does it have preemptive power, as it states here, against other federal statutes and regulations? And two, what does it do to states and counties? If you could, my time is up, if you could respond to that in writing uh, with the chair's approval. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my question is, under subsection 4, which has the preemptive authority over restricted fee tribal lands. Right? In other words, I see this that once you publish, once they're given this status and they publish in the Federal Registry their tribal rules and that goes through the necessary procedure, that that will have preemptive power. Now, is it your understanding under this provision that that would then give the tribes the right to do preemptively as to any other whether you're calling the mining rights or whatever else, because this specifically gives them preemptive rights. And in addition, how does it then play into any states or counties? And, and personally, I've always believed that, you know, they, they preempt that too. But I, I just want to know how you feel in terms of that provision, and this is subsection D of this particular bill. Well, I, I, think, I think the bill is unclear because it only mentions Section 415, which is the Indian Long-Term Leasing Act. If it mentioned other statutes, then it would have the preemptive effect that you're talking about as a matter of federal law. If it mentioned um, uh, rights of way, it doesn't say that it, it also preempts um, Indian mineral leasing or Indian mineral development. That's not in the bill. So I don't think that that would be there. Those would still stand as federal statutes that are on the books. Um, but in terms of, I, I think the bill also does address that um, for taxation that it would be preemptive of, of others and your question going to, well, once the tribe has, regu has their own laws and their own regulations, does that preempt all these other laws? I think that's still an open question that has legal issues associated with it. Um, that is it, does it violate the supremacy clause? Um, are, there, are there other, and, and we'd be happy to work with the committee on, on working through those legal issues to, to get to its intended effect. Mr. Chair, may I ask one other question? But, Mr. Secretary, subsection D specifically states, subject to a restriction imposed by the United States against alienation and taxation, shall preempt any provision of federal law or regulation governing the use of such lands. To me, that's a pretty general preemptive statute. Had this paragraph been in subsection C, I would agree with you that the restriction is basically to long-term uh, or for whatever you're talking about, 415. But this is generally a, a section that stands on its own and it gives it preemption authority as long as the rulemaking process of some sort, and the, the publishing it in the Federal Registry, is complied with. So are you reading any provision of federal law or regulation differently than I am? Or, or, and tell me how you get from there, what you're saying, under subsection D to the restriction. Well, I'm, I'm getting to it through subsection C, which is the, the subject matter of the uh, tribal authority over restricted fee tribal lands, and it specifically cites the Indian Mineral Leasing Act. And then it goes on to say, and for those that we've mentioned where we want this preempted, then we have tribal laws over the restricted fees in that area, and that's what you would like to see the preemptive effect. That's the part where I'm not sure it reaches as far as maybe you're reading it, and there are just these legal issues uh, to work out to see um, if you can accomplish what you would like to accomplish. And if you could take that back to your attorneys, because, you know, that's subsection C, and this is subsection D. So on statutory construction, I believe D stands alone. But I've already overstayed my welcome. Thank you. I, I, I thank the good lady, and if I, if I can indulge you for a moment, uh, please get active in this, <laughs> because... Um, I'm sitting there blinking my eyes, uh, but this is what we need. This, this is a discussion process, and if you're willing, Mr. Secretary, to really work with us, and don't, don't slow walk me, um, with the ranking member and the members themselves, um, because my goal here is to get things done right, do it right, and keep us uh, on the road to, I think, real self-determination allowing them to do as they wish to do on their lands and not lose the trust authority that we do have a responsibility for. So that's our goal. And this has never been an adversarial position. I just think it's time for us to step forward, time for us to solve a problem. So let's all get together and keep working on this thing, and we'll see what happens.
So can you tell me what do you see as the difference in terms of holding land and restricted fee status versus holding land in, in the, when lands are held in trust in terms of Indian country? Is there a difference? You know, uh, the concept of, of Indian country is, uh, is very common as it relates to the two in, in that it is lands uh, that are acknowledged as, as occupied by, uh, you know, the Indian tribe involved. Uh, can't be sold, uh, can't be taxed, you know, otherwise protected by the United States from that kind of alienation. But, but it's clear, you know, from, from the history, but also the way the United States has treated our lands, that our title is acknowledged. These are our aboriginal lands. They've never been uh, uh, literally or figuratively under the control or possession of the United States. And, and so as a result of, of that foundation, in addition to historical events relating to the leasing of our lands to some non-Indians over 150 years ago, um, uh, we have had disclaimers, statutory disclaimers by the United States to have any authority over the leasing of land, uh, right, issuance of rights of way, um, you know, in our territory. So we have total control over land use in our nation. And so restricted fee could mean uh, slightly different things as it relates say, to Pueblos. And there's a certain historical passage of time element. Uh, even in Oklahoma, you know, there is fee title that is possessed by the nations there. And there's been a different sort of legal path forward. But I'd say that our nation, uh, which I know best, of course, you know, have a, a kind of high watermark in terms of our autonomy. And so while it's all Indian country, um, I think in terms of both the organic nature of what we have, plus the way the Congress and the United States have treated us, we have a significant uh, degree of autonomy. Uh, it may be Mr. Coulter um, who, who said this earlier, in, I mean, in his testimony, in his written testimony. But I guess what I'm trying to draw the distinction on is that, is it because of your treaty status that you also have the restricted fee part and also the uh, prohibition against alienation as well as the protection from taxation? Because I think in one of your testimonies, and I believe it may have been Mr. Coulter's, it said that one of the great misperceptions is that somehow, unless you're Indian country, you do not have the benefit of the protection against taxation, and that's why everyone tries to become Indian country mm -hmm. to protect the lands from taxation. So uh, is it because of the way you're set up that you don't have that the taxation? Because you do say mm -hmm. you have the alienation provision plus the freedom from taxation. Is that the treaty status that established that? It is, it is uh, in part, yes you know, that it is the organic foundation rooted in the treaty recognition of our aboriginal title. It is um, the uh, uh, acts of Congress subsequently to disclaim any authority over leasing uh, of lands in our, in our nation. Uh, and it also, is it also the assertion of power by our tribal government over the years, over the decades, that, that pushes out and, and exercises this power uh, on a day-to-day, -day, year year-to-year basis. That is this combination of law and, and frankly of governmental power that provides us with this autonomy. So what about the autonomy? We know well, subsection D references mm -hmm. any federal law provision. Mm -hmm. However, how, with your history as a Seneca Nation, how then do you interface with, with regulations of your counties and your state, uh, the state and county government? Are you, because of the treaty status, also exempt from those regulations? Well, ma'am, I would, I would suggest that we're not exempt, we're immune. Immune. Um, Fine. That, that's that a, these governments have, have never had authority in our nation, mm -hmm. um, and we actually spend an awful lot of time resisting the, uh, the encroachment by outside governments at the county and, and sometimes the, uh, sort of the state level. Have you done level. that successfully? Uh, yes, we have, actually. You know, and, and it has taken uh, the form of conflicts over the uh, such provocative issues as cigarettes, and, uh, 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 but also land use and taxation. We're constantly fighting, frankly, to protect our land base. We could use a little bit more help from the United States in some of these battles because we think that that's what we negotiated for. Uh, but it is, it, is, uh, it is constant. But to, to also answer your question, we're also not irrational you know, or extreme. And there are situations where we exercise our governmental power cooperatively and through partnerships sometimes with the local governments, sometimes with the state governments, sometimes with the United States. Um, we have common interests as a people with the American people in public safety, 
So, for example, my nation fairly recently uh, made a very significant financial grant to the Cattaraugus County Sheriff for purposes of dealing with drug interdiction and problems associated with uh, the abuse of, of prescription drugs. So it's just one of many examples where we work cooperatively when we don't have the resources or when we do have the resources um, to deal with jurisdictional issues with our neighbors. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the extra time.